it's wonderful to be here tonight. I've admired Chai Hack Night and followed you for a while, so really happy to be speaking and sharing um, and talking about one of my favorite things, Chicago Books to Women in Prison. Um, I want to get one thing out of the way. Some of you may know this, but um, our name may suggest that we focus on perhaps Cook County Jail or Illinois State Prisons exclusively. We send books across the country um, from New England, California, Florida to Honolulu as of recently. And um, that's state prisons and federal prisons. And we're one of about three dozen books to prisoner programs in the United States. But first I have a question. Does anyone here like books? Um, would anyone feel their life diminished if they didn't have access to as many books as you'd like, as you're used to having? Tarika in Florida wrote this on the back of a letter to us. And I think it captures really well how the women to whom we send books feel about the importance of books. We work out of a church in the Ravenswood neighborhood. It's like a little used bookstore in feel. We have thousands of books, all donated, and just on just about anything you can think of. Everything's done by mail. Um, one of our volunteers here is doing the paperwork after selecting three books from our large library. What you saw in the last photo was about a tenth of our collection, which changes all the time. Uh, we send a personal note with each package of three books. Um, something positive, something inspiring, something um, encouraging to someone who may not get much mail at all. Uh, we have a little assembly line going every Saturday and Sunday when we meet. Books are chosen, uh, books are uh, processed, paperwork prepared, packaging done, and uh, about a hundred packages like this go out the door every week. We keep count. Uh, last year we mailed over 4,000 packages of books and blank journals. Um, about 12,000 books in all. And I want to note too that all those books probably, almost certainly, based on what we hear, reached many more women. Um, women in prison share books. One book might make its way to dozens of women over time. Uh, a formerly incarcerated woman I've gotten to know tells the story of uh, a friend of hers giving her a book about 10 years um, before she left. She read it, passed it on, and about 10 years later, shortly before she was going to be leaving prison, a friend passed it along to her, said, oh, I think you might like this. That happens a lot, and um, we, we see that as a testament to the great need for books, and it's also, um, it's also a testament to what women tell us, they're, they're happy with the care that we take in preparing book orders. If you're looking really closely, you may notice that this letter on top of our fulfilled stack was mailed in August and fulfilled in, on October 8th. So we have about a three month backlog um, and that's okay. Um, we'd like to reduce that, but at the same time, we, we aim to be equitable. We, we log orders, keep track of who orders when, so that someone who writes us every week is not going to get more books than someone who writes us every three or four months. This is just a portion of our order form. Um, gives you an idea of the breadth of books. We send books on topics other than these, but these are some of the most frequently requested books, all types of self-care. Uh, fiction, nonfiction, education, activities. I mentioned that we're one of uh, about three dozen books to prisoner programs. We're one of only two that focus on women. Um, 
men make up the great majority of people in prison, 93 or 94 percent. Um, although the number of women is growing at a higher rate than that of men. So the need is continuing to grow. And we focus on women um, not because men and women read exclusively different kinds of books. Of course, men and women share many, many interests, but there are some special needs for women in prison, and that helps us meet those needs better. Parenting. The great majority of women in prison, 75, 80%, are mothers of minor children. Now, that probably is about the case for men, but there's a big difference. Uh, according to Bureau of Prison Statistics, when a man goes to prison, about 83% of the time, the mother of the children will continue to care for the children. There's no interruption in the children's care, or very, very little. When a woman goes to prison, only about 37% of the time is the father of the children going to be caring for the children. So that means um, when a woman goes to prison and she has children, chances are they go into foster care, uh, relatives may care for them, um, neither of which is a very trustworthy situation or one that leaves a woman in prison feeling very comfortable about it. So books on parenting are a huge, huge request. And there's a, there are books written especially for parenting from prison. Um, we're glad they exist, um, unfortunate that they do. Trauma. People who work with women in prison have a lot of evidence that women in prison, maybe 80% or more, um, have been victims of trauma in their life. It's a, it's a big part of the, the pathway to prison for women. Um, about a very high percentage, again, 80, 90% have been victims of abuse in their life, as children, as adolescents, as, as women. So we, we work very hard to make sure we always have books on hand to meet those needs. Um, because unfortunately, in many cases, the books we send might be the best help they're getting. Um, health care, mental health care in prison is, is sorely lacking. And for women with a history of trauma and abuse, the environment of a prison is probably the worst place one can be. Human trafficking. Um, we added this to our collection and our wish list on Amazon after learning from a, a prison official in Florida that I met through Twitter who, um, after working in a women's prison, one of the largest in the country and one where we send many, many books, um, found plenty of evidence supporting that there are people on the outside targeting and grooming women on the inside of prison. Um, women who have indeed been victimized and um, have a strong chance of continuing to be victimized after prison if they don't have support in the community. Um, and I just want to make sure I am drawing a distinction between women who are victimized in this way and women who choose to be sex workers. Um, there are indeed women who have been victimized in this way. So we, um, we have been gratified to see that more women have been asking for books on this. And knowing how often books are shared, it's a pretty good chance that more women than that are, are learning about it and becoming more aware and perhaps helping protect themselves or, or friends of theirs. True crime. Um, this is in here to show we only have like we only had three books on hand when this photo was taken, and it's a, you know, there are books that just fly out the door. Um, you know, and while I, I did want to spend some time on some of those really serious issues where women are dealing with, women read for entertainment when they're in prison just as, as, as anyone does. So um, books on true crime and mysteries and thrillers and what have you, if something's popular on the New York Times bestseller list, chances are it's we're going to hear for, from a lot of women asking for it. We send a lot of GED books. Last year we sent 362. Um, these are the books that many, many wonderful people bought for us from our Amazon wish list after Giving Tuesday and through the holiday season. Um, a lot of other books besides, but 
Um, people in prison, um, only about 40% have a high school diploma when they enter prison. Um, has a lot to do with perhaps why they're in prison anyway. Um, so for many women, getting their GED is a huge accomplishment, um, not only in perhaps um, going on to other educational um, goals, but also as a personal attainment. We send blank journals too. Um, something as simple as a composition book that might cost a dollar, dollar twenty-five, even in the prison commissary, um, that's out of reach for many people. So we send blank journals to the prisons that do accept them. They all don't because they sell them. Um, and we, it, it can be hard to get as much knowledge as we'd like to have about um, the reading experience of the women we serve, how they use materials, but we do um, things from time to time such as this little um, survey that we included with journals over the course of a year. And we got back quite a few responses and some of the responses were kind of expected, but we learned about many more ways that women use something as simple as a composition book. Um, one woman wrote us on a little scrap of paper that she needed one because she's in class, but they don't give them any paper to do their homework on. Absurd, but um, that's the reality. Um, we, we get all sorts of um, wonderful letters. And I'm going to just read uh, two or three brief ones, because I think there's nothing more important than hearing the voices of the women themselves. And that's something we, we emphasize in a lot of ways. And we share um, excerpts of letters, um, art that women send us, this wonderful piece of male art here. You can see part of it. Um, this drawing also was the, on the cover of an anthology of writing and art by women in prison that we published in November. Um, Terry in Florida wrote us, I am at the Bradenton Bridge work release and I'm working on getting my GED. I am 54 years old and have always wanted to get my GED. And now that I am here, I'm able to work on getting it. And thanks to you, I have a book that will help me understand the work. I'm very thankful to you for the book. So thank you from my heart. Um, Bobby wrote us from West Virginia. Just wanted to say thank you for sending me books. I think it's really great what y'all do. Getting mail in here is a big deal. It makes you feel like someone cares. There was also a little handwritten note saying they hoped I enjoyed the books. And getting that really made my day. So again, thanks for all you do. And Francis in California. I would like to say, since I've been a part of your program for over two years, I believe, and you people there are so nice in your little responses to me, and when you don't have something I've asked for in books, you find something close to it, and for all you've done, for all the books you've received, I've received, I'd like to say thank you for making my time in prison a little more easy. And I'd like to thank all the nice people who've donated books. Nice people, I know deep down in my heart, that there are some good-hearted people in the world. Not all people in prison are bad women. We're just as human as the next person. We made a mistake in our life, and we're paying the consequences for our actions. We've already been sentenced and tried, so society should stop judging us and just remember um, we're trying to. I'll show you a little more art, because this is a delight we get. We have our fans. And this is Magnificent Maud, painted by Anastasia in Indiana, I believe. And we get little, much loved, uh, little expressions of thanks like this. We're at 4511 North Hermitage, Sunnyside and Hermitage in the Ravenswood area. And we uh, get together every Saturday and Sunday afternoon from 2 to 5. And if you'd like to just drop by some time and take a look and walk around and, and see what it, what it is up close, please, please do. 
We have volunteer orientation every month. It varies from Saturday to Sunday, um, depending on the month. We have a waiting list because we keep the size of each month's group rel moder moderately sized so it can be a good experience. Um, but if anyone here would like to be a volunteer and, you know, if four months from now you decide you'd like to try this, so you have some time, email us and say you were here and you'll go to the top of the list. Another perk of Try Hack Night. <laughs> so I wanted to keep that kind of brief and just answer questions. Yes, sir. What's the most popular uh, subject that uh, books are requested about? Probably a dictionary. A dictionary, um, just an English dictionary. We can always use more of those. But, uh, but in addition to that, um, in terms of um, other books, GED books, very popular, um, true crime, urban books, it, exceedingly popular. They don't stay on the shelf. Ma'am, what made you start this program? I didn't start it, actually. Um, it was um, founded in 2002, and I've been volunteering since 2011. And my pathway to Chicago Books to Women in Prison, I was actually looking for a tutoring opportunity or the chance to lead a reading group in a prison or jail. And I looked online and didn't find anything. Um, and I've since learned that there are plenty of opportunities at Cook County Jail, right in our backyard, but you're not really going to find them by just looking online. You have to find the right phone number of the right person, um, which now we have. But I learned about this group. And I went one Sunday and got hooked. It's, um, it's a very concrete, personal way to help people. You're, everything's done by mail, as I mentioned. It's an individual's letter or her filled out order form, selecting books for her, um, making as, as good a match as possible uh, between her requests and our inventory. And, and most of the time we do a really good job because we, we have many, many more books in our um, stock than we had when I, when I began. We've just grown over the years in very good ways. Um, so I, I think there's a, there's a lot of personal satisfaction. Um, if you like books too, it's, it's a really, it's a fun way to volunteer as well. And, and you know, most of the people who volunteer are people, readers, people who know books. There's some librarians who volunteer. And I assure you, everyone who volunteers learns about a different, a, a new genre or a new craft or a new subject matter they had never even heard of. I had no idea there was such a thing as Amish romance. <laughs> They're very popular. Um, so again, very personal, very concrete, and really making a difference in people's lives. Um, I want to add to that, though, sometimes, and I had a conversation with one of our um, funders over the years, and wondering if we weren't um, working towards social change in the way that they like to see their grantees do it. And, thought about that for a long time and had a good conversation with them. And they, they realized that what we do is a kind of, it's a kind of urgent intervention. You know, we're, if we stop selling, if we're selling, if we stop sending books, um, feeling that somehow we were letting the state prison system or the federal prison system off the hook, um, that w it wouldn't change the fact that, by and large, prison libraries are very poorly stocked. And when people have access to a prison library, that access is, can be extremely limited. It varies from prison to prison, of course, but women write us and say they can get to the library, say, 20 minutes every two months or something. So um, it feels good to do it and, and, and to know that it's making a difference. Uh, we had a question in the doc that says, what are some ways that techies, designers, or data people might be able to help the organization 
Uh, I think you've, you've mentioned some ways to volunteer as well, but I guess the question is maybe if there's more. Yeah, no, that's um, great. And, and I'm going to be sticking around and perhaps can people who are interested in that, we can, we can talk together. Um, you know, I mentioned, I showed you the, the little flyer asking for insight into how people use journals. I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to collect data in different ways. Um, again, it's all done by mail. Everyone isn't going to reply. Um, people move around um, from prison to prison, but I think there's an opportunity for us to improve our insights into their situation and better serve them by perhaps coming up with some novel ways to ask some simple questions and learn more. Um, we are, one of the projects for this year is revamping our website. I, I think there's a little designer lined up for that and we'll be working with her. Um, we are, another project and we are, I think this is going to happen, but it's been going on a long time, so it, it may not be. <laughs> um, I followed up recently and was a little bit still up in the air. Um, we, we, we keep track of orders, I mentioned, and it's kind of a, I think I've heard all databases start as spreadsheets. Ours is still a spreadsheet. Um, and there's an organization in Madison, LGBT books to prisoners, and they're going to adapt a database um, someone on their team developed and to our needs. So I, I hope that happens, but it may not. <laughs> I, so th I think things like that. Sounds like that could be a good breakout group here. Yeah, I think it could be. Uh, I was wondering, how do prisons get involved in the program, or how do you get prisons involved? Yeah, great question. Um, some of the prisons where we send books, we've been doing it since before I started, and I, I, I can't be sure of the, exactly the, how we got our foot in the door, but there have been some recent um, additions. Um, uh, we recently got new or orders from a couple federal prisons we hadn't before. I think what happened in those cases, women were transferred from other facilities they had our order form where they knew our address and wrote us. And um, so the, we haven't gotten books returned from those prisons yet, which is um, always, you're never, you're never sure. Um, so surely word of mouth will spread in those facilities and we'll be getting more requests from that facility in Seattle and, ha and the one in Honolulu. Um, for a long time, we weren't getting many requests from the two Illinois state prisons for women. And it was sort of puzzling, but we didn't really have a contact at all to, at the institutions to ask. Um, and there is a Books to Prisoners project in the Champaign-Urbana area, which sends to, I think, every Illinois prison, uh, mostly all the men's prisons, of course. And there'd been the assumption that perhaps the, that program was sending to Logan and Decatur. Um, we found out that wasn't the case, and we have a really good collaboration with an organization called Chicago Legal Advocacy for Incarcerated Mothers. It's part of Cabrini Green Legal Aid. And when the attorneys go to see their clients at the prisons, they, they don't work on criminal cases, they work on family law, custody, um, arranged divorces, what have you. They take our order form. And whenever they go, they come back with a stack of maybe a, you know, 100 or so completed forms. So we have partners out there that help us get the order form into. Um, and we also um, are, show up in listings that appear in prisoner resource guides, um, photocopied sheets of resources that are circulated, that kind of thing. So some people read about us there. Two sort of related questions. Do you partner with literacy organizations to help bring people up to speed so that they can uh, tackle Amish romances and true crime novels? Because those are, can be challenging reading. Second question, what's the demand and supply of books in Spanish? Um, we are a member of Chicago Literacy Alliance here in Chicago. So I think there's, there's more opportunity than we're, we've taken advantage of as a, an all-volunteer organization. Um, so I think there's opportunities there. But one thing that 
you know, sometimes people ask for, you know, three urban novels, three true crime, and we don't have them, so we send something else. And people are encouraged to, like, push, push the reading a little bit. You know, you, one thing we always keep in mind, um, you know, I mentioned that only about 40% of people go to prison having attained a high school diploma. That's reflected in reading levels. Um, and sometimes that's obvious in the communication we receive. Um, sometimes it's not, and if we don't know, it's probably just a good idea to select a book that isn't going to be too um, challenging, perhaps. Um, but in addition to that true crime or urban book, put something else in the package that might expand their horizons a little bit. Um, but we, you know, aside from the relatively low reading level, um, that doesn't hold across the board. We, we do get letters and requests from women who um, clearly have more education and are interested in more um, sophisticated um, literary fiction or, you know, there's every once in a while there's someone who asks for something on Nietzsche or um, the latest physics book or something like that. So, um, oh, I'll, I'll add too, um, um, especially given the gathering, we're getting more requests for technology books. We can always use more current technology books. When people donate like Windows 95, it's not that helpful. <laughs> Um, and more prisons, and not enough, not enough, um, are realizing that when, you know, someone's in prison for years, um, and when they leave, they're going to be entering a world of not just laptops, but phones and the internet, and they may not have been exposed to this. Um, so there are some prisons that are taking some steps to, um, provide education and experience in, in the digital world to people who will be entering it. Um, California has some programs in teaching coding in prisons, including in a couple of women's prisons. So people have gotten jobs when they've left prison after those programs. So um, we're really glad to see that. Although there are prisons that will not accept anything to do with computers or the internet or even web design. Because I, I, I believe the reason is there's like an overgeneralized fear of hacking. They're just, <laughs> it's, um, and your other question about Spanish books. We do get um, orders in Spanish. It's still a pretty low percentage, but we have, and the, our collection is accordingly much smaller in terms of Spanish books, but we have a pretty, pretty broad selection. And we can always use more more Spanish books of all kinds. What are you doing to, catal to catal catalog the books? Um, not very much at all. <laughs> um, it, it's, it would be great. It would be great to be able to go and look and, oh, someone's asking for, um, I can't think of a book at the time, <laughs> a particular title, and know whether we have it in stock. But um, being an all-volunteer group, um, so many books come in and go out every weekend that it would be a, a huge job. It might not be, there might be a way to, to create a system in which it could be done very, very simply. I mean, scanning barcodes or something. Um, like an ISBN number. Yeah, exactly. The same way people have, you know, when they're going through thrift books to see if there's anything they can sell, they can do it really quickly. Um, and that might be something we could look at. And I could even see us starting um, with just a, some title. Some things come in and go out so quickly. It might not be the best use of that. But there are other things that we know we have it in overstock. We know we have it in this box that's in the storage room. Well, and sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. But that might be something um, we could look at. One thing we don't do yet, and this is sort of related to um, needing to develop a real database is keeping track of the books that people order and that we send. Um, because 
Sometimes women write it and they're, they'll be asking for James Patterson. He's written a lot of books, but there's also the good chance that the random James Patterson we pull off the shelf is one they've read. And sometimes they'll tell us, but I think a lot of times they don't, and we run that risk. Um, so that's another way, perhaps, a better, you know, not a better use, but simply using data in, in that way might be helpful. So, and I know there are some groups like ours that do that. So it's just a matter of step-by-step -step improving our capability in that way. But all, all good ideas. Uh, you would mentioned earlier about limiting the number of volunteers that you ha bring in um, every weekend. I was wondering if you'd like tell us a little bit more about that and kind of how you arrived at that as the pattern. Uh, and maybe talk a little bit about, I assume, volunteer satisfaction is kind of what you were sort of going for. With yeah. Um, we limit um, the new volunteer orientations to about 10 people every one day a month. and. Um, and there's a, they, they come an hour before our main work session, so it's quieter then, and they can get um, just a little, little better space um, to learn about it, go through the, the steps of fulfilling an order, learning a little background about the needs, um, the background of the organization a little bit. Um, that seems to be working pretty well. Um, when I started, it was just come any time, and then the, just a volunteer would show me. And I think, you know, it, it sort of worked okay, but it sort of depended on which volunteer would show the new person, whether, whether it was really the optimal orientation experience in terms of learning the process and everything. Um, that, and that's partly a, also a function of our space right now. Um, we are renting space from a church, I mentioned, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good um, relationship of this, the space. We might, be, we might be outgrowing it, so we're actually working really hard to um, do some reorganization, revamping of the workflow, and we're sort of in the middle of that. So the space is one reason to um, um, and we, we have a, a survey we, we ask new volunteers to complete an anonymously if they choose to and it seems to seems to be working well and we could probably expand that but until we get our or expand the number of new volunteer orientations but until we get the space situation sort of more or less optimally rearranged as we're working on now, we might want to wait for that. Do you have grants that support you? Um, we do, um, but our main um, source of financial support is individual donations. We get a um, pretty steady stream of um, online donations throughout the year. We have a major fundraising um, program in December. We'll probably be um, revamping our communications to our, our database this year and more regular communication. So I think that's, we're going to be getting um, more individual donations. And that, that might be a $5 donation occasionally, but that adds up and we have some, we have some donors who give substantially more than that. There are some foundations that we apply to for grants too, and we've been pretty successful with that. But it's probably, by, um, it's probably about 70% individual donations, 30% grants. And the grants are usually for special projects versus general operations. Um, some of the grants we've received um, in the last couple of years have been um, one from the Chicago Foundation for Women, from their um, LBTQ Giving Council. So they granted us a, a nice sum of money so we could buy books specifically um, to beef up our 
inventory, which isn't what it should be given the number of requests we get for lesbian, bi, trans, and queer books. So, um, and we've been purchasing those from a local bookstore, so we're happy to give them the business. And another grant was, um, helped fund our um, publication of the anthology in the fall that I mentioned, uh, Writing and Art by Women in Prison. And that also paid for an important um, activity that some of us took part in recently. Adler University has something they call the social exclusion simulation. And it's an exercise putting you in the role of a woman who's been recently released from prison. So there are different stations, housing, food, um, a job, et cetera, et cetera. And you need to go and complete these things and have them sign off. But, but you get a little, it's, it's, you get a little bit of the feeling that one gets when one's trying to do the right thing and you, you run into, oh, the housing station has a sign that says closed, or you find out you need to do this before you get that. Uh, there's a little bit of a catch-22 that they build in. And so we were able to pay for that, which will help inform um, our understanding of the situation our women face a little better. Um, another substantial opportunity that a couple of grants helped fund, about a year and a half ago, we did focus groups um, at Cook County Jail and also at Logan Correctional Center, which is about several hours away from Chicago. So it paid for our expenses and travel to Logan primarily. So we had the opportunity um, in eight different sessions to sit at the table with women to whom we send books. And we talked about their experience as readers in prison, what um, their experience as readers before they went to prison, what books they like, um, what the prison library is like, um, all sorts of related questions. It was a really good opportunity. I got, um, I got called out for once because I also said it was fun. You know, I, it was more than fun, but I think it's perfectly appropriate to say that one enjoyed that opportunity to sit and have a conversation with the women. Just out of curiosity, I was wondering what is in or what subject does uh, gay trans books have in it? Well, um, it's books that speak to their experience. I mean, women who are lesbian or bi or trans or queer, they, 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 they request on any kinds of books, but they often, um, because of their experience, especially in prison where their identity might not be um, a comfortable one, depending on the particular prison and the environment, um, books that speak to their experience. They might be memoirs, um, they might be medical or health-related books that are geared towards their, their lives more, um, both fiction and nonfiction. What challenges uh, is the organization facing as it continues to grow? Um, yeah, one is um, related to what I, um, how I replied to Derek, our space situation. It's a, um, it's a really good home for us, but we're, a little, we're, we're bursting at the seams and, and doing our best to work with the space and reconfigure the workflow. And I think that's gonna make a big difference. It has already, but, um, but that's, that's, one, that's one thing. Um, another thing is prison restrictions. Um, we get used to dealing with some very, some known things we have to watch out for. We're not going to send a book with roadmaps in it. Roadmaps can be used to plan escapes. <laughs> Quite serious. We have to be, uh, is, but then, okay, there's a book about Paris. Is it really going to be a risk to someone in a prison in Arizona to have a, you know, we take our chance and send it, so. But that, but that is the kind of thing, um, you know, a book with a, an image of a gun on the cover. Even if there were, a poet wanted to donate quite a few copies of a book of poetry, the poetry would have been much welcomed by the women who received the book, but there was a fairly gratuitous, as far as I can tell, image of a gun on the cover. So we, we weren't gonna accept those books. Um, sometimes there, 
restrictions just seem puzzling. Um, and, th and there's some logic to it if you dig deep enough. Um, a popular book is it's a book of origami paper. Crafts are very popular, and there's, there are two or three editions of that are just every page in the book is a different sheet of beautiful colored patterned paper. There's a prison in Florida that won't accept them. I know, I don't, do they don't like cranes or something? I don't know. Um, but I, I learned from someone who volunteers at a different prison in their library that probably the reason is they don't want to encourage barter. I'm not saying I approve of that, but um, um, they, someone, they could, there's a, every prison has a little underground economy. Well, it, might, it might be contraband, it might be just stuff from the commissary that someone has bought and is holding on to till they can trade or sell it at a time when the commissary is closed for it, perhaps. Um, one, some prisons don't accept coloring books. You know, adult coloring books are extremely popular. They're relaxing, they relieve stress, they, um, they're fun. Um, and I'm wondering about that and the same context said, well, at that prison where she volunteers, they don't allow people to have colored pencils or crayons because the, um, the pigment can be used to make tattoos. So that's what I hear. But, but then prisons will change their policies from time to time. And we're dealing with two or three situations now. There's a, uh, a prison in Indiana that, where we've been sending books with no problem for, for a long time. And um, we, one day we show up on the weekend and there are dozens of packages returned from this prison. That's not usual. So um, did a little asking around and the, the prison is going to require brand new books versus used books, which is the bulk of our inventory. And we do get books that are new than, that are donated or books that can pass as new. Um, and they also want to, want to do away with the little personal note on the back of the invoice. It's not as if anyone is sharing personal information or even we don't write our last names or, um, so I'm not sure what the story is, but we are, um, one of our volunteers has some contacts who were able to give us a little insight into ways to um, perhaps negotiate this with the warden and whom we could contact with possibly a very good chance of success if she did not um, agree with our reasoning um, on this. Oh, and another thing they wanna do is, rather than <clears throat> our sending the books after fulfilling the order, we would have to send a list of the books to the prison for approval before we could send the books. And that creates a space problem. It's just a, it's, it's just a whole other very time consuming step. Um, and it doesn't really even seem to make much sense because it's not as if once they approve the list, they're not gonna check the packages when they arrive. Just, just check them as you always will. Um, so we hope we'll have success with that. Um, there's a prison in Florida where we've been sending composition books for years with no, no problems. Um, we got a note on one of the women's book orders um, saying, oh, we can't get comp books anymore because someone um, slipped drugs in the spine of one. Now, what, was pro what probably happened is the prison had been allowing family and friends to send composition books and care packages and what have you. And that's probably how that happened, but rather than Looking at the situation kind of more rationally as in, we've never had any problems with Chicago Books to Women in Prison or any other Books to Prisoners project that sends books here. Let's continue to let them send comp books, but we'll crack down on family and friends sending materials like that. So we hope 
can give them a chance to sort of cool down and maybe um, then we'll approach them and see if we can continue to um, send books. So that, that kind of thing happens. It's um, frustrating. It prevents us from serving the women as well as we would like to and um, it's time consuming and trying to deal with it. Uh, next, if you uh, answer this, how many different prisons do you work with? Um, it's probably, last count, it was probably close to 60. And probably the great majority of our books go to about um, maybe half of those prisons. There are some prisons where we don't send that many books yet. And that's a matter of word of mouth, maybe hasn't gotten around yet. but. That's federal prisons and state prisons. And Cook County Jail, that's the only jail we'll send to. Jails, um, people tend not to be there for very long, which uh, creates a little bit of a problem in, in, in the amount of time it takes for us to process their requests. And also jails tend to be more restrictive. Many jails, or most that I've ever looked into, require that books come from a publisher or bookstore. All right, well, thank you very much.